Please turn in your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. Nehemiah 1, 5 through 11. Now remember in 586 BC, Judah was devastated and conquered by the Babylonians. Jerusalem was destroyed. The walls of the city were torn down and burned along with the temple. And it was utterly devastating for the people. On top of that, many of the people of the land were deported to Babylon and they were captives in Babylon for 70 years. Finally, after 70 years of captivity, Ezra 1 tells us that the deported Jews were given the opportunity to return to their homeland. Out of some 2 or 3 million Jews who had been deported from the land, only 50,000, about 2%, decided to return to the promised land. But they did return. And in the days of Ezra, they rebuilt the temple and they laid a spiritual foundation for Israel once again. The book of Nehemiah begins 15 years after the book of Ezra ends, which is now about 140 years since they were conquered by the Babylonians. So again, just so we're clear, Ezra tells us that some of the Jews returned to the land, they rebuilt the temple, which was absolutely amazing, and they began to spiritually reunite the community under the leadership of Ezra. But look, there's still no wall around the city of Jerusalem. Now what's the big deal about that? Well, it's a big deal. First, Walls around ancient cities were for protection. No walls, no protection, that's not good. Also, when the Babylonians came and conquered Judah, they tore down the walls of that city. Torn down walls represents defeat. It represented weakness. It represented the fact that you had been conquered by your enemies. And so, rebuilding the walls would represent a new day. Not only that the city would be protected from their enemies, but also that God was with them and that a new day of hope was indeed dawning for them. But look, there's still no wall around Jerusalem. The book of Nehemiah now picks things up by telling us that Nehemiah, that Jewish man who was a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes, he had heard from his brother and some of his companions that the people who had returned to the promised land were in, and I quote, great distress and reproach. And also that the walls of the city of Jerusalem were still in shambles, which is some very, very bad news. See, Nehemiah had grown up in Babylon and he had never been to Jerusalem, but even so, his heart was burdened for the Lord's work and also for the Lord's people. They aren't doing well. That's not good. See, Judah and Israel was God's land, the promised land. The Israelites were God's chosen people. Jerusalem was God's holy city where the temple of God was located, and every Jew should be concerned about all of that. And the fact that the people aren't doing well, and that the city still had no walls, is absolutely horrible news. So, what did Nehemiah do? Well, he did what all of us should do when we get some very bad news. He wept, he mourned, he prayed, and he fasted. Today, we get a really good look at his prayer, and it's a great prayer indeed. Verse 5, let's go ahead and read that. Verse 5, and I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you, and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. We're going to stop here for now, and here we see Nehemiah's prayer to the God of heaven. This is indeed one of the great prayers of the Bible, and we can learn much from this wonderful prayer by Nehemiah to our good God who hears the prayers of his people. There are five parts to this prayer, the first being this, that Nehemiah acknowledges God's greatness, and that's always a great place to begin. Like a lot of other biblical prayers, Nehemiah begins by telling God about God. Isn't that interesting? Why does he do that? Because this helps Nehemiah to put everything into perspective. See, when we remember that God is God, problems therefore seem to get smaller. So look, Nehemiah begins, I pray. 
Now, prayer is simply talking to God, and God's people can never go wrong when we pray to Him. Our God is indeed a sovereign God, and He sovereignly works through the prayers of His people. I love it in Daniel chapter 9 when Daniel goes to God in prayer. While Daniel's in prayer, the angel Gabriel appears to him and says, Daniel, at the beginning of your supplication, at the beginning of your prayer, that's when the command went out. I love that. In the next chapter, the same type of thing happens where again, an angel came to Daniel and said, Daniel, your words were heard and I have come because of your words. I have come because of your prayers. That's amazing. And it shows us The power of prayer. Look, not only does God command it, and not only does the Bible tell us that prayer is powerful and that prayer avails much, but also the Bible is full of examples that show this to us as well. And the wise Christian is the one who prays much to the God of heaven, to the one true God, the Lord God Almighty, our God. Nehemiah knew that, and so he prayed. I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, You keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. How important is it for us to remember who it is that we are praying to? See, and it's good to acknowledge that fact. Oh yes, Lord God of heaven. That's who we're talking to. Nehemiah understood that. And that's an absolutely incredible thought. Lord. Now remember, the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew and Aramaic. The Hebrew word translated Lord comes from a word whose consonants are represented by the English letters Y-H-W-H. See, ancient Hebrew has no vowels, so no one really knows how to pronounce this word, which is used for the Lord's name. The two most common pronunciations are Jehovah, which is a Latin pronunciation that's been used since the 16th century, with a J instead of a Y, an A and O and an E thrown in as vowels, and a V instead of a W, Yahweh, or as they would have said in the 16th century, Jehovah. And then you had Yahweh with only two vowels added in. But again, no one really knows what the real pronunciation of this word is. The word tetragrammaton, which means four letters, is often used as a technical term to refer to this Hebrew word, which when you're reading through the Old Testament, It's easy to spot because it's usually translated simply as LORD in all capital letters. The word refers to God's self-existence, which sets Him apart from everyone and from everything else. The word is linked to how God described Himself in Exodus 3.14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. See, God's name is a reflection of His being. God is the only self-existent, self-sufficient being, and only God has life in and of Himself. He stands alone. See, look, He's the God of heaven. What does that mean? It speaks of His transcendence, of His majesty, of His superiority, of His lordship over all things. See, Nehemiah's God and our God is the Lord God over all creation, the God who rules heaven and the God who created the earth and everything in it, the God of all gods, our transcendent creator who fills heaven and earth. Lord God of heaven means that he alone controls the material and the spiritual, that there is no sphere that he doesn't rule over, and that he alone is worthy of universal worship and glory from us, his creation. Also, look, he is our great and awesome God. The word great means to be great and remarkable in magnitude and in extent. That's who our God is. The word awesome means to inspire awe, reverence, and fear in someone. Where the greatness is just so big that all you can do is see how small you are in comparison and then you respond accordingly. See, our God is great and awesome. Anybody? Right? (laughs) He's to be revered, respected, and feared by us as creation. And that fear should drive us to worship Him with reverence and wonder, to love Him deeply and intensely, and to earnestly then desire to obey Him as our Lord, our Creator, and our only Savior. See, the great and awesome God indicates Nehemiah's appreciation for who God is. The one whom Nehemiah feared and revered, and the source and the object of his deep faith and love. 
Here's the thought. God is awesome. He's majestic. He, he's Lord and He's Creator. He is all-powerful. He stands alone. No one remotely compares to Him. And look, He hears me. Sinful old me. He loves me. He saved me. He rescued me in all my wretchedness and in all my sin. Who am I? Now that's the idea. And Nehemiah does well to recognize that fact from the very beginning of his prayer. Or else you could say, it the way Jesus said it when He taught His disciples to pray, Our Father who art in heaven. Same idea there. In this model prayer, Jesus taught the disciples and us to begin our prayers by recognizing the God to whom we pray, which is exactly what Nehemiah did here. We do well to do the same. See, when we pray, we're not just talking to an old buddy or to some impotent God like the Babylonians worship. No, we're talking to the Lord God Almighty. Right? The awesome, powerful God who rules over all. And look, He is a loving Father who invites us into His presence and who genuinely cares for sinners like us. Come on. Isn't that amazing? Think about that. We, we can talk to the God of all creation. What a privilege. What an honor. How many people today would die just to talk for a few minutes to the one person that they look up to, a sports hero, that, that preacher that you admire so much, the, the lead singer of the band that you love, whatever. But think about this. We can regularly talk to the God of all creation, and He wants us to do that. What? I remember when I was a new freshman in Bible college, when I was able to pray with a few of the senior spiritual leaders on campus. The senior spiritual leaders op leader opened up his prayer with these words. He said, Lord, dude. That's what he said. Lord, dude. He called God, dude. He thought he was cool, but he wasn't cool. Notice that Nehemiah didn't start out his prayer with Lord, dude, buddy, pal, fella. No, Nehemiah would never have done that. God, our God, is awesome. He's to be feared and revered. He is serious. And talking to Him is both a privilege and an honor that shouldn't be taken lightly or trivially ever. Nehemiah continued, You who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. How good is that? This is who our God is. This is what He does. See, because He's perfect and never lies, and He keeps His covenant, He keeps His promises, all of them to His people. Look, throughout the ages, God has made covenants with His people. He has made many, he, he has promised many things to His people and He keeps all of them. Now the Hebrew word for covenant is the word bereath. It speaks of a pledge, of a promise, and of a binding agreement between two parties. Covenant is a very important word in the Bible. It's used over 280 times in the Old Testament and over 30 times in the New Testament. See, throughout the Bible, God is known as a covenant-making God who is faithful to keep His covenant promises. A way to help us understand covenant is marriage, where two people, a man and a woman, pledge to be married for life. Faithful men keep their marriage covenant and faithful wives keep their marriage covenant. And while people today take this promise lightly, they didn't used to. Oh no. In ancient times and also in Scripture, covenants were the foundation of society. And when you made a covenant with somebody, you bound yourself to that promise and your character, your integrity, and your reputation was bound up in your loyalty to keep that covenant, to keep that promise that you had made. Professor Keith Essex states, Let no one underestimate the importance and significance of a correct understanding of the divine covenants. It's much more than an intellectual pursuit. They provide a most foundational theological anchor for understanding God's working in human history. This is important. Here's a brief summary of the covenants of God. In the Noahic covenant, God showed His gracious mercy toward all mankind by promising to never again destroy the world with water. By the way, next time it's going to be with fire. Okay, good news. Okay. The sign of this covenant, the promise, is the rainbow. And when we see the rainbow, we can remember that God keeps His promises and that God is indeed a gracious God who shows His mercy and grace even after judgment. In the Abrahamic covenant, God made many promises to Abraham, including land, a great nation, Israel, and that all the people of the world would be blessed through Him, which is a clear reference to Christ. 
In the priestly covenant, God promised a perpetual priesthood in the line of Phinehas. In the Mosaic covenant, God revealed His holiness and the heinousness of sin. This covenant included the Ten Commandments along with 600 other commandments, all revealing the need for the shedding of blood for the remission of sin, which is a perfect picture of people's need for a Savior for Jesus Christ. In the Davidic covenant, God promised the perpetual reign of the descendants of David, ultimately fulfilled in the Messiah and in His eternal reign. And then, in the new covenant, which we as Christians are under, God evidences His continual pouring out of grace. The new covenant was promised in the Old Testament, specifically in Jeremiah 31, where God promised to forgive iniquity. How good is that? And remember sin no more for all who believe, both Jew and Gentile. Jesus instituted the new covenant during the Last Supper. He sealed the covenant with His shed blood on the cross. And when we believe, God says that He will give His Holy Spirit who will indwell us, who will seal us, who will guarantee the incredible promises from God for us that are to come. Every single one of those promises. And look, God is a God who doesn't just make promises, but He's a God who keeps His promises, all of them. He's also the God who is merciful to those who love Him and who keep His commandments, Nehemiah says, talking about true believers and don't we know it. The word for mercy is the Hebrew word has said. And it speaks of God's unfailing love, kindness, goodness, and grace to us as covenant children, Nehemiah, and to us who believe today. This is very personal, see. It's very personal. God isn't just a God who is far off. No, no, no. God is our God. He set His love on us. He chose us. He died to save us. This is personal. This is extremely personal. And those who love Him, those who keep His commandments, same thing. Those who are His children, those who are saved, we know how good He is, do we not? He's so good and merciful and gracious and kind. Look, the God that we get to talk to is a God who is intimately involved with all of His covenant children, with every true believer, with you. He knows you. He knows you inside and out, and still, He died to save you. And again, this is personal. This is personal. He loves me. The God of all creation loves me. Me, yes, me. And He wants me to talk to Him. To present my cares and concerns to Him. To go with Him. To go to Him with all my problems. To express my love. To confess my sin. To pray continually to Him. What an honor. How could I not do this passionately and continually? Why would I not do this passionately and continually? And so Nehemiah is sure to tell God about God. Which reminded Nehemiah who it is that he's talking to. He's Lord. And we get to talk to Him. He's the God of heaven. We get to talk to Him. He's the God of greatness. He's the awesome God. The God who keeps all His promises to His children. The God of mercy. Or as Jesus said, He's our Father in heaven who is to be hallowed by His people. And we do well to pray like that because we have a contagious zeal to magnify the name of God and to bring Him glory, this awesome God whom we love. True of you? Second, Nehemiah pleads for God to hear him. Verse 6, Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant which I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel, your servants. Now question, will God hear him? <clears throat> yeah, ab absolutely, he will. And Nehemiah already knows that. The psalm says this uh, numerous times. And 1 John 5.14 says that this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, his children. What a thought. Psalm 10, 17 says, Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their hearts. You will cause your ear to hear. Psalm 65, 2. O you who hear prayer to you all flesh will come. Proverbs 15, 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. What a thought. And Psalm 55, 17, David said, evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud and he shall hear me. So yes, God hears the prayers of His people. On top of that, 1 John tells us that our confidence is that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. In other words, we get what we ask. 
That's what it says, and therefore we can know that to be true. Right? I mean, that's what it says. And so we look at this and say, yes, I love this verse right there. That means that I can ask God for money or things or respite from my suffering or a life of ease. I can ask God anything I want, and I get it, right? That's what it says. There's a caveat, right? Four words. According to His will. See, we don't get everything that we ask. Even when those things seem good to us, if they aren't according to the will of God, but if they are, we do indeed get them. But the problem is that we don't always know or understand what is truly according to the will of God. I mean, I know what His will is generally for me as I read my Bible and see what He says. His will is for me to, to flee sin, to pursue holiness, to share my faith, to shine His light, to pray much, to guard my heart from idols and so on, which are clearly scriptural truths for every true believer. But what about the other things? Like healing someone, or big decisions that I need to make, or little decisions that aren't clear in Scripture. What then? It's not always so clear to us. Look, I've prayed for the salvation of many people who have not gotten saved. I've prayed for the restoration of sinning Christians who haven't repented and been restored. I've prayed for the reconcil reconciliation of Christian marriages that have broken up. I've prayed for many people to be healed who haven't gotten healed. So what do I do? Do I stop praying? No. I keep praying all the more, and I trust God with all that. And then I just trust that if my prayer doesn't get answered the way that I pray, then it wasn't God's will. And if it does get answered the way that I pray, then it was. But my call is to keep on praying. So what do I do? I ask, but then I have to say, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. Now, I don't think you have to say that every time you pray for something, but you have to know it to be true. I prayed for many healings, and while I might, not, I might not always say in my prayer, not my will, but your will be done, I still know that to be true, and I trust the Lord with that. He knows better than I do. And so I pray and pray and pray, and then I leave it in the hands of God. Look, it's hard to pray according to God's will because His ways are not our ways, and we often think that He has to work in the way that makes sense to us, which He doesn't have to do. If I had been a disciple of John the Baptist, I would have been praying that he be released from prison and have many more years of effective ministry. But God's way was to have a drunken, lustful king make a dumb promise that resulted in John getting his head chopped off. But you know what? I still would have prayed for John's release and then I would have trusted the Lord with the outcome. God knows. If I had been in a, the apostle John, I would have prayed for God to spare my brother James. I mean, James was one of the inner circle of three disciples who was especially close to Jesus. He was a great man of God, and yet, look, God permitted him to be put to death by Herod. So the people prayed for James to live, and he died, but they still needed to pray and then trust the Lord with the outcome because he knows. Around the same time, Peter was put into prison, and he was going to die, but the people prayed, and God sent his angel to deliver Peter from the same fate. So the people prayed, and God's will was for James to die and for Peter to live. But no matter what, the people's call is to always be praying and then to trust the Lord with the rest. So God hears the heartfelt prayers of His people, and He promises to grant our requests when we ask according to His will, but it's not a simple name it and claim it thing, not at all. God's will is that His kingdom will come, and yet the outworking of His will involves thousands of years and many setbacks. And we are called to persevere in prayer even when we don't understand God's will or His ways. God knows. He knows way better than we do. Nehemiah knew that God would hear. He knew. But he's really asking God to take action. Lord, hear my prayer. And Lord, act on my prayer, please. Note that his prayer is offered day and night for the children of Israel. So this specific plea is a final summing up of a long persevering succession of prayers, prayers that lasted for four months. We're going to see that next week. See, Nehemiah prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, eagerly, passionately, and persistently, and he's a great example for us today. You pray like that? Jesus prayed all night, many times. Nehemiah prayed persistently day and night for weeks and months, and it reveals his earnestness of purpose and his unflagging faith. See, more prayer is better. And so I'm going to keep going to God with this issue. 
along with mourning, weeping, and fasting. Lord, hear my prayer. Hear my prayer. He will. But Nehemiah still asked it, and it shows his heart for the suffering people, and it shows his dependence on the Lord. The idea, Lord, hear me. Please, please, Lord, please hear me and answer my prayer. You ever pray like that? I've done it many times. Even though you know God hears you. It's amazing to think that God hears our prayers. I mean, how great is our God that He can pay attention to each of our heartfelt prayers, millions of them around the world, individually, personally, and simultaneously, and He cares about all of them, every one of them from us. Our minds can't comprehend it, but God is beyond our comprehension, and it's still true. Third, Nehemiah confesses. In verse 6, Nehemiah mentions the confession of the sins of the children of Israel, Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both the, my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. This is very good. Here, Nehemiah confessed on behalf of the children of Israel. And he used the terms we and even I. See, sin is corporate as well as personal. And Nehemiah, even though he's not in Jerusalem, he allies himself with his people in such a way that he includes himself as having sinned along with them. That's important. I mean, why ask God for deliverance and rescue from your trials when you're still in rebellion against him? And then there's this. Why would God deliver you when delivering you makes you comfortable in your sin and it makes you complacent towards your God and when the trials are the thing that drive you to Him all the more. But confessing your sin, repenting of your sin, looking unto God and seeking His face regardless of the outcome, even if you continue to remain in your trial, man, that's good. Confession is very good. One particular sin is singled out. The people of Israel has been in, have been in possession of the Word of God and they have disobeyed it. Verse 7, we have acted corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you've commanded your servant Moses. That's the real reason behind this whole tragedy. Yes, some would have put the blame at the feet of Artaxerxes who had stopped the work of rebuilding, rebuilding the city's walls back in Ezra chapter 4, but that wasn't the reason. No, the real reason was the people's sin. They were the cause of the problem. They were God's people. They had God's word. They knew what God wanted for them. And they rebelled against him and he disciplined them for it painfully, but mercifully. He had to do that for their own good. And if sin is the cause of the Jews' plight, and it was, turning from it back to God in repentance and faith is the remedy. Confession. Nehemiah recalls what God had told Moses. How he would show mercy on those who returned to him and keep his commandments and do them. Not perfectly but passionately seeking to honor God, repenting much and focusing on glorifying God in their lives. See, repentance is key. Turning back to God and living for His glory and honor, that is key. How important is this for the people of God today? Look, harboring sin isn't going to do you any good. Living in sin, indulging sin, embracing sin, loving sin, it won't do you any good, but it will do you great harm as a child of God. Flee from it. Confess it. Give it over to God. Repent of it. Turn to God and battle hard against that sin, but please don't embrace it. No. Look, we are called to love God and to hate sin, and we battle against sin, and repentance of sin Heartfelt turning away from sin and back to God is key for all of us, not just today, but every day. And if not, danger, discipline, and pain. Confess sin regularly, often, daily, moment by moment. As one noted, repentance is a missing element in the modern church. We are far more concerned with forgiveness than repentance we want the blessing without the pain of turning our backs on sin. We skate so closely to the grace promised by the gospel in abundance that we fall headlong into the sinning that grace may abound mentality. Nehemiah will have none of it. He understands all too clearly that apart from genuine, heartfelt repentance, a turning away from sin to God, 
Without that, there is no forgiveness. And so Nehemiah confesses the sin of the people and of himself, knowing that without that, why should God deliver them and why should God help them at all? Just like we are called to make things right with others before taking communion, so too should we confess any unrepentant sin when we go to God in prayer? Of course. And we should go to God in prayer constantly. See, So please, make confession of sin and repentance a regular part of your Christian walk, uh, of your prayer life, so that sin is constantly being given over to God. And also, so it doesn't settle into our hearts and into our minds, which is very dangerous for every child of God. Confession is good. It's very good. Fourth, Nehemiah asked God to remember his people, verses 8 through 10. Let's look. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Now look, in this prayer, Nehemiah reminds the Lord that the people of Israel are his servants and they're his people. They're those whom he has redeemed, those whom he has paid a ransom for on their behalf. See, the children of Israel were God's people just as God was their God. He had pledged himself to them and this now forms the basis of Nehemiah's prayer. Here, Nehemiah seems to be saying to God, Lord, you can't abandon these people without going back on your word, without denying yourself. That's bold, but it's good. Note that Nehemiah isn't trying to strong arm God. No, no, no. He's simply appealing to the promises of God. Nehemiah basically says, Lord, you made a promise to Moses and to this nation. I now ask that you make good on that. Nehemiah quoted from both Leviticus 26 and from Deuteronomy 30. As one noted, this no doubt is the secret to great power in prayer, to plead the promises of God. We may get a bit annoyed when one of our children comes to us saying, Daddy, you promised, but our Father in heaven delights in it. He delights in it, and often He demands it before prayer becomes effective. And so that's exactly what Nehemiah did. He pled the promises of God. In Psalm 81.10, God said to His people, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. I love that. As one said, God won't open His storehouse until we open our mouths in asking Him to perform His promises. So again, ask Him. In verse 9, Nehemiah quoted from Deuteronomy, if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, that is a conditional promise. The condition was returning to God and keeping His commandments. Nehemiah couldn't know if the nation was keeping the commandments, but he did know that he was keeping the commandments. And because he had identified himself with the nation in their sin, the nation could also identify itself with Nehemiah in his godly fulfillment of these conditions. He's saying, Lord, he's a great leader. We repent, we return, we confess. Lord, help us like you said you would. See, that's the idea. It's very good. It's very good, and we do well to do the same in our prayers. This is a promise of God. I trust your word, Lord. We have returned. Keep your promises, which I know you will. Fifth, Nehemiah asked for success. Verse 11. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. He's talking about King Artaxerxes. We're going to look at that next week. For I was a king's cupbearer. The prayer is now coming to a head, and that's finally when Nehemiah makes his request. After, think about this, after acknowledging God's greatness, after pleading to God, to hear him after confessing sin and after asking God to remember his people and his promises. And so Nehemiah concluded by asking God to hear him. And then he asked God to bless him when he would soon speak to the king of Persia about this matter. See, Nehemiah was intent on doing something about the sorry state of Jerusalem's walls and its people. And he knows that without God's intervention, he can do absolutely nothing. And so he prays, hey, 
He's just a cupbearer to the king. But can God use someone like him? Can he? He's just a cupbearer. Yeah, but he's a man of prayer. He's a man of God. He's a man of great faith and a man of great boldness. Can God use him? Oh, yes. God can most certainly use someone like him, even you. Spurgeon noted this. Laying the matter to heart, he did not begin to speak with other people about what they would do, nor did he draw up a wonderful scheme about what might be done if so many thousand people joined in the enterprise. No, it occurred to him that he would do something himself. And that's what he prayed about. Before he acted, though, because he's going to act, he prayed, and then he must trust God with the outcome. The Expositor's Bible Commentary notes this about this prayer. When we glance back over the prayer as a whole, we are struck with its order and progress. As in the Lord's model prayer, the first part is absorbed with thoughts of God. It's after uplifting his thoughts to heaven that the worshiper comes down to human need. Then a large place is given to sin. This comes first in the consideration of man after the worshiper has turned his eyes from the contemplation of God and felt the contrast of darkness after light. Lastly, the human subjects of the prayer begin in the wider circle of the whole nation. Only at the very last, in little more than a sentence, Nehemiah brings forward his own personal petition. We can learn from that. Thus the prayer gradually narrows from the divine to the human and from the national to the individual. As it narrows, it becomes more definitive till it ends in a single point. But this point is driven home by the weight and force of all that precedes it. See, he's, his heart is right. His focus is right. And only then does he pray for what his need is. It's a great prayer. We can learn much from it. Hey, talk to God. Please, talk to God much. Honor Him. Glorify Him. Tell Him how awesome He is. Confess your sins and repent often. And then make your request and then trust Him with the rest just like Nehemiah did. Lord, help us. Now perhaps this is where you find yourself today. Waiting on the Lord. Nehemiah waited for days and weeks and months when all he could do was pray. All he could do. Huh. All he could do. Nehemiah never thought like that. For to him, prayer was the first thing that he desired to do. Is that true of you? Is it? God's people understand this, and they pray much to the God whom they love with passion. May God speak to our hearts this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Nehemiah and for this prayer. I pray that it would sink into our hearts that we would learn more about you in this prayer, that we'd also learn more about how we should pray ourselves. Help us, Lord, teach us. Help us to trust you. We don't understand all your ways. We are very small compared to you. But help us to trust you, increase our faith, and help us to know that you know exactly what you're doing. May we be a people of prayer. And I pray that you would bond us together in this commitment. Bless us now. We love you and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you tonight. Thank you.